Hello. For those who have not had the pleasure of meeting, my name is Alan Gottlieb. I'm the founder and executive vice president of the Second Amendment Foundation, as well as the chairman of the Citizens Committee for the Right to Keep and Bear Arms. The two groups are the main sponsors of the 2021 Gun Rights Policy Conference, which just happens to be our 36th annual one. And boy, have they grown over the years. This has been quite a year for the gun rights movement. Our opponents have thrown everything they can at us, plus the kitchen sink. You know, we've gone through all kinds of federal legislation that hasn't been passed that we'll be able to stop. We just recently stopped the David Chipman nomination to run the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, a great victory for the gun rights movement. The gun rights movement won. Biden gun ban lobby, zero. We scored really, really well. This has been a great year. If you stop to think about it, we now have more uh, Second Amendment sanctuary cities and counties than ever before. We have more states with constitutional carry where you can now carry a firearm for self-protection without having to get a permit to exercise your constitutional rights. This has been a phenomenal year. We've also had a banner year in courts. Right now, there are over 40 federal lawsuits in federal court and state court protecting our, and extending our right to keep and bear arms. We even have a court case on the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court for them to hear in the next term uh, that deals with the right to carry. Uh, it's going to be, a, I think, a banner victory for us. So despite our opponents throwing everything they can at us, we're advancing the football down the field. But I just want to remind you of one thing. It's like a football game where the rules have been changed. It doesn't matter how many points we score. If they score one touchdown, they win and we lose our rights forever. So that's why it's extra important that we be very vigilant and we keep fighting as hard as we can. Add to that, we had both in 2020 and 2021 a record number of new first-time gun buyers uh, and gun owners. And, and those people are getting very heavily engaged in the gun rights movement. In fact, uh, thanks to the Citizens Committee for the Right to Keep Our Arms and the Second Amendment Foundations running national TV spots on over 20 networks. In fact, the Foundation has run over 1,600 national spots and the Citizens Committee over 1,000. We've brought in several hundred thousand new supporters of Second Amendment rights. The, the people buy their firearms, they now don't want to protect that right. It's really been a big banner year for the, for the gun rights movement, and that's what makes this gun rights policy conference so extra important. We're going to reach more people uh, streaming this online than ever before, and with your help, uh, not only will we, we get more information and be able to share it, but we'll be able to take it and use it in the next coming 12 months to make sure that our gun rights are protected and extended. I just want to give you a warm welcome to this year's conference. Uh, it's an action-packed agenda, so let's get on with it. And thank you for participating. It's you that makes the gun rights movement what it is. Hi, I'm Reverend Ken Blanchard, also known as the Black Man with a Gun. I want to thank you for joining us and being a part of this Gun Rights Policy Conference 2021. I got the blessing and the opportunity to give the invocation today, and I'd like to do that with your help. Will you bow with me? Heavenly Father, the eternal God, lover of our souls, the only one true God, we come before you now to say thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this staff, which has put this on. Thank you for a country in which we can celebrate our freedom. Thank you for the opportunity to protest, for to redress our government, to be what you've called each of us to be. Help us to continue to be defenders of this country, defenders of our families, defenders of ourselves. We ask, Lord God, that you would allow us to be responsible, to be respectful, to be honorable, to be righteous, to be found righteous. Father, protect us from all hurt, harm, and danger. And when danger comes, help us, Lord God, to be able to meet that danger, to be your guardians, your warriors, your peacemakers. Thank you, Father, for another day of service. Thank you for the opportunity to help our neighbor, to help our friend, to help those who don't know you. I ask a blessing, Lord God, upon this conference, upon each person watching me and listening to me right now. I ask, Lord God, that you allow your presence to be felt in this place, no matter where we are, even though we're separated by time and distance and time and space, that you would allow us to be on one accord with one another. I ask a blessing for the God lips, Lord God, and for all those of the Citizens Committee for the Right to Keep and Bear Arms for the Second Amendment Foundation as whole, 
for each member collectively and apart. Thank those who are coming and thank those that have a blessing for those who this is their first time watching. Father, I've been a part of this thing since 1991 and I truly thank you for it. The friends that I have met along the way, you have put in my path. I thank you for each and every one of them. Father, we go through some hard times together. We go through some hard times alone, but together we can make a difference. You said in your word that where two or three are gathered in your name, there you be in the midst of also. We are more than two or three. We're trying to bind our nation. We're trying to save our country. We're trying to save the freedoms that we enjoy for our next generations. We're asking you, Lord God, that you would be present in those decisions, that you'll be present in our hearts, that you would make sure that we seek others, that we are good stewards of what you have given us. And that's everything. This land is your land. And we ask, Lord God, that you allow us to share the good news, to share freedom, to share protection, share security, share love, share all that we've been blessed with. Father, we know that if we do your work, we'll be coming up against opposition. We know that if we do the right thing, we'll be going against the wrong, the evil, and those who seek to destroy what we believe. Father, give us strength and courage to meet our task. Don't let us waver. Don't let us falter. Keep us up and prop us upon each leaning side. I thank you, Lord God, for these, your people, who love this, your country. Continue to bless us and keep us, and we shall be blessed. It's in the wonderful name of the spirit that you sent us that I pray and say thank you. Amen. Well, family, let's get ready to rock and uh, may God bless you and hold you in the palm of his hand. This is your friend and your brother from another mother, Reverend Ken Blanchard. Shalom, baby. Hello everyone, I am Cheryl Todd of Gun Freedom Radio, and I am excited to have been invited to talk with you today about how saving freedom has been impacted through the history of women and guns. Now, last year I spoke about the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment that legally allowed women to vote and about how in these past 100 years, too many women and men alike have used their vote to suppress and infringe on certain parts of our Bill of Rights, including our rights to keep and bear arms. Did you know that even when women could not legally vote, we did legally have guns? Our foremothers used guns to hunt, to protect their land and livestock, and to guard over the safety of their families and homes. Firearms and ammunition in the home were basic household tools, as basic as having, say, a hammer and nails. And yet here we are in the 21st century, now trying to reclaim that normalcy and those rights to possess, carry, and use these life-saving tools of protection. Somewhere along the way, someone told us that women don't use tools and too many of us have bought into it. And someone told us that moms, you know, good moms don't allow certain tools into their homes. And a group has even commandeered the word moms Moms demand something not really specified, but it equates to guns are bad. And if you're a mom or a woman or a decent human being of any kind, you will agree with them or else face being ostracized and canceled. Can you imagine all of these strong, smart, capable, competent women in our nation and really the world, being convinced that hammers and nails are 
too dangerous for we women to handle. And yet, too many of us have bought into that idea when it comes to firearms and ammunition. It's embarrassing, really. And it's time to reclaim our equal rights to own whatever tools we need to pursue life, liberty, and happiness, whether it's hammers, nails, guns, or ammo. In preparation for this talk, I posted a question on social media asking what specific woman people would like to know more about. The flurry of helpful comments and ideas was rapid fire, exciting, and energizing. People are clearly engaged and curious about how, with our rich history of women and guns, we have become so backward thinking over the years. Faster than I could write, people posted names like Annie Oakley, who became a sharpshooter out of the necessity to put food on the table for her family. Ida B. Wells, an African-American feminist, journalist, educator, and an early leader in the civil rights movement. She even helped to co-found the NAACP. Harriet Tubman, anti-slavery superhero of the Underground Railroad and the many but mostly forgotten women who fought in the American Civil War. Also, the fact that when our nation was still a group of colonies that were subservient to the rule of Great Britain, women were counted as gun owners. We weren't allowed to own much else, but guns were among our personal possessions. And then there was Eleanor Roosevelt, the first lady of four-term Democratic President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Eleanor is famous for breaking the mold of the traditional role played by a first lady, for having served as first lady for four terms, and also for personally keeping and bearing arms. I wonder if the people who convinced us that women and guns don't mix are the same ones who told us that the Second Amendment is somehow a political issue and all Democrats are supposedly against guns. Well, whoever is floating that nonsense apparently didn't get their memo to our feisty and self-reliant First Lady, Eleanor Roosevelt. Here is what is true. Our Second Amendment is a unifying, non-political and inalienable right that is in our constitution that is for all Americans. It is a mere 27 words long and it legally protects our rights to protect what we love. And that is something everyone agrees on. So when I posted my social media question, one of the people who weighed in and even met me for lunch to go over some ideas is a woman who herself will be remembered by history, Ashley Lebensky. Ashley not only was the curator for the Cody Firearms Museum for several years and is a walking, talking encyclopedia of history, but she also has made history by testifying to Congress, setting the record straight about the misnamed ghost guns and in doing so has worked to preserve our freedoms. Other contemporary women who have greatly and positively impacted our rights to keep and bear arms are Jeannie Jennings and Peggy Tartaro, who wrote and edited the Women and Guns magazine for many years, helping to tell the stories of women who are making a difference to protect our rights. Also, Dr. Susanna Gracia Hupp, whose parents were killed in a horrific mass murder at a Luby's cafeteria in Texas in the early 1990s. Susanna was following misguided laws, which left her unarmed at the exact moment when her firearm might have stopped a murderer from killing and wounding nearly 50 people. Susanna has continued to use her voice to advocate for more 
life-saving freedoms for all of us. A woman who is one of my personal heroes is Juliana Versnell, one of our hosts every year for this very event, the Gun Rights Policy Conference. Julianne has spoken at the United Nations to defend the right of women to protect themselves with firearms. Through instruments such as the wrong-headed Arms Trade Treaty, international gun control is a genuine threat and could ultimately strip individual firearms rights from people here in the United States and indeed all over the world. Finally, no conversation about the history of women and guns could be complete without mentioning one of my mentors, Diana Muller, who founded the DC project, Women for Gun Rights. Diana saw the need to bring women together to counter the anti-rights groups with the truth that women do own guns, carry guns, and we value our rights to do so. In five short years, Diana has grown the DC project into a powerful force that has a state director in nearly all 50 states and whose members have run for offices, won elections, and have testified in front of both state and federal legislative bodies on behalf of protecting our Second Amendment rights. There are so many amazing women whose names should be on this list. I wish I could mention every single woman who has made a difference and fought for our rights to keep and bear arms. But I think that is so much the point. It is all of the millions of ordinary warriors like you and me across this nation, women and men too, who daily instill our precious and unique American constitutional values of liberty and freedom into each generation who keep our homes, our neighborhoods, our cities and our states safe by being responsibly armed citizens and teaching those things to our children and our children's children. This is a history unfolding in real time. We stand on the shoulders of giants and we cast their vision into the history of our nation's future. And each person listening and watching today, thank you for all you do as part of that legacy of saving freedom. Thank you. The story I'm about to tell you begins really, and it's sad to reflect on it, I was about to say 40 years ago, but actually it's pretty close to half a century. I, my personal involvement, I was a young law student back in 73, and I was writing an article for the Arizona Law Review. My editor, Mark Collins, um, told me I'd written an article that demonstrated that gun control would not work, but this is a law review. We have to have something legal in there. So why don't you put in a section on the Second Amendment? And I was skeptical. I responded that, well, we all know that just relates to states having National Guard units. And that's what we all knew. It was the received truth back at the time. Nobody had looked into it. Well, he said, do it anyway. So I went out and started researching it and discovered, no, there was a very impressive case for the proposition that the Second Amendment was meant as an individual constitutional right. And I found more and more on that. Uh, Anti-federalist writings, uh, the Federalist Papers, some original research. So I wrote up a law review with that as the first segment. And the editorial board, which was composed of students one year ahead of me, a law reviews or student edited, uh, turned it down. They said my arguments were specious. Ultimately, I managed to get it published at a different law review, not Arizona, but Chicago, Kent. And back in 73, that was the first law review article uh, to take a Second Amendment individual rights approach. 
but there was an entire movement starting off at that point in time. Uh, all of us acting individually, there was no coordination, there was no backing of it. Uh, the mainstays of it were Steve Halbrook and Joyce Malcolm and myself. We repeatedly published articles and eventually started to specialize. Uh, Steve more or less owns the 14th Amendment, McDonald v. Chicago, as I've said before. If uh, you could get a, a if the copyright applied to Supreme Court decisions, uh, Steve would be making a fortune off uh, McDonald. Joyce Malcolm branched into English history of the 17th century. And I did more generalized material. There was also a lot of other individuals who were publishing, um, Bob Dowlett, uh, Richard Gardner, David Kaplan, the late David Kaplan. But this is in the 70s going into the 80s. Now, back then, the Second Amendment Foundation began what is the predecessor to the event you're participating in. Back then, it was the scholars uh, meeting, symposium on the Second Amendment. And I think the first one was 1977, maybe, I'm pretty sure it was 77. And they would be annual events for people who were in the small population of people publishing on the Second Amendment. And those events were, you know, very interesting for us at the outset. Uh, I met not only Alan Godley, but one I met uh, Don Cates, Don Cates, as we joke about him, the late Don Cates, sadly. Uh, I met uh, Joyce there. I met Steve Halbrook there. We Once a year, we would all get together and have a chance to meet and talk and all of that sort of thing. And we were cooperative. We were sending around manuscripts that hadn't yet been published so was to keep the other people in the field alert. Well, we were doing the original research, and I emphasize the original research. Later on, much would be built on that foundation, but for the time we were discovering things, putting together evidence. Uh, Steve was exploring the 14th Amendment angle. I was exploring roughly the 18th century, 19th century area. Joyce Malcolm was researching into original archives at the British Library and other British sources. So we were putting the evidence together. It was all laid out by the end of this period. Most of the critical things. I can remember the exchanges. Uh, Steve uh, Halbrook discovered Tench Cox's uh, newspaper editorial, which mentioned the Second Amendment. And then I would discover that James Madison wrote Tench Cox a thank you letter. And then Steve would go on and find that the editorial was published in multiple major papers. We would be cooperating, reciprocating in that way. But we were publishing in the minor law reviews. At that point in time, there were about a hundred law reviews, give or take. Uh, no law professor had time to read all of them when they came into his mailbox. We were I was publishing my case, Chicago, Kent, uh, Steve, I think was uh, University of Kentucky and other places like that. Uh, Joyce got into Hastings Constitutional Law Quarterly, which was about as high as any of us got. The major names in the legal field, constitutional law, were not going to be reading those. Once you got them interested, they would go back and read those and find all the original evidence, but you had to get them interested. And that was the big breakthrough in 1983, if I remember. Don Cates got an article in Michigan Law Review. Michigan is one of, well, certainly one of the top 10 law reviews. Some people would say top five, but essentially the big names in constitutional law would read the Michigan Law Review. And Don Cates got the article in there based on the original uh, evidence that had been found. <coughs> And it had an immediate impact. It shifted the dialogue we were having to a whole new plane. Because now the big names were alerted to the fact that this was an issue. And it's sort of critical to know that at this point in time of early 1980s, uh, constitutional law was sort of stagnating as a field. Uh, you'd had the Warren Court decisions that had remade so much of constitutional law. Those were 
1960s, early 70s. At this point, it's all been, what, what are you going to write on if you're in con law? Um, obscenity, sorry, there's a hundred articles on that already. Fighting words, eh, same thing. Uh, freedom of religion, that's been written over for 20 years. Now suddenly you have a new field, and that caught on. Uh, the first to pick up on it was Sanford Levinson of the University of Texas. Uh, he published in the uh, Yale Law Review an article entitled The Embarrassing Second Amendment, pointing out that it was embarrassing simply because if you applied the same standards of constitutional interpretation to it as you did to any other constitutional amendment, you'd have to conclude it was a broad private right. Again, Yale Law Review, probably the top in the country, and Sanford Levinson, probably one of the top five con law men in the country. Others read his work and went back and did their own writing. Uh, William Van Alstein, of, um, ultimately William and Mary, uh, then of Duke, he published an article along the same lines, saying, yes, it's an individual right. All the evidence is there. Uh, Akhil Lamar of Yale, probably our top man on the 14th Amendment in the country, certainly the most published, uh, he published articles that were saying, yes, this is an individual right. Uh, finally, the last holdout was Larry Tribe of Harvard, whose uh, textbook Constitution, American Constitutional Law was a big name publication. In his first edition, he was obviously gritting his teeth, and he said something about the Second Amendment is uh, an individual right of uh, possibly of uncertain dimensions. And then his second edition, he had to come out and say, yeah, it's an individual right. So you've got the big names in constitutional law, Levinson, Amar, uh, Van Alstein, and Tribe, all lining up to say, some of us like us, some of us don't, but it is an individual right. What had been completely unacceptable uh, 20 years before now became, in Glenn Harlan Reynolds' words, the, the standard model of the Second Amendment, the thing that explains everything and against which everything else is tested. <coughs> Uh, he said that in a uh, symposium issue of the Tennessee Law Review. Symposium uh, issues come out once a year, and basically it's an entire vol volume of the Law Review devoted to one topic. And that in 1995, you could have a symposium issue on the Second Amendment speaks for itself. So that's how it got started and how it culminated. Beyond there... Uh, of course, you know the story of Heller and McDonald and how it developed from there as theory was turned into fact, as uh, law review writings became something else, more practical. A while back, about a year, I ran into a member of the editorial board for Arizona Law Review when you were ahead of me. That is to say, she was on the board that rejected my article. And she just said, you know, back in 1973, your thesis was uh, totally unacceptable. And today it's the law of the land. It must feel pretty good. It does. Hey guys, welcome to GRPC 2021. My name is Kevin Dixie, everyone calls me KD, and I am here to speak to you about history, uh, particularly black history. Uh, I'm gonna bring my knowledge, or a bits and pieces of my knowledge to the conversation when it comes to um, black history and firearms. So I'll be up front and I'll tell you that, you know, uh, the panel, that runs GRPC was nice enough to send me like a breakdown of how to do it and you know talk about this incident then expound upon it. I'm not really good at doing that so I'm not going to attempt to do that today. What I'm going to do is have a heartfelt conversation with you and I'm going to mainly freestyle this conversation with you about a couple of incidents in history and how they mesh or match up with understanding 
the black experience when it comes to firearms. And you might say to yourself immediately, hey man, it's an American experience. Now, you're not wrong. However, you are not seeing it through the black Americans' eyes and their viewpoint. And I wanna assist you with that today, along with giving you some factual information that assists you when you are out fighting for gun rights. When you're having this conversation, when you're expanding the diversity in gun rights, you just can't tell everybody how you see it. You, you really, it benefits us all when we all understand different perspectives. So let's start first with the kind of base understanding of how many black Americans look at firearms ownership differently than other Americans. For example, 1776 is a, a year that you can see on t-shirts. You can see 1776 inscribed on certain guns. It is yelled, it's on flags. And 1776 is monumental in world history, not just even American history. Like what would the world be like if 1776 never occurred? If America didn't gain its independence, I have no idea what the world will be like, let alone just America, right? So it's very monumental and we should all appreciate it. There is no denouncing its importance. When it comes to gun rights though, I want you to understand something, or freedom in general. In 1776, America did gain its, ind uh, its independence from a foreign land. It became free and it celebrated that. Well, in 1776, I was still attempting, attempting to gain my freedom from America. So I wasn't free. And I had no gun rights. Even when you look at the ratification of the Constitution, or the Second Amendment rather, when you look at that, you'll understand that those laws, the Second Amendment wasn't written for me. I was a piece of property at the time, right? So we don't write gun laws, you know, for our cars to defend themselves or our, our cattle to defend themselves, right? So they didn't write these laws for people that were in, in, in slavery uh, to be free. It just wasn't the way that it worked. As a matter of fact, the black codes uh, that predate the establishment of the country and some of those other laws actually were, you know, in opposition of black people ever having firearms. So I like to inform people that before we were even an established country in 1776, that black codes or gun laws predate the establishment of the United States of America. And why would that be? Well, would you want some people that you were hitting with chains and uh, separating their families and beating and torturing and raping and hanging and burning? Would you want those individuals to gain any tools of freedom? Um, so they didn't want them to read, they didn't want them to write, and they dang sure didn't want them to have anything that could be used as a weapon, including a firearm. So. And once we push past 1776, and the reason I bring that up is because a lot of people are saying the right thing, but you're so right that you're losing the battle because you haven't allowed yourself to see other people's perspectives. The thing about freedom is freedom is personal. Freedom is something that uh, everyone has to have their own relationship with, right? It's really hard for me or you or anybody else to shove our example of freedom down someone's throat. And when you are missing the perspective of 43 million Americans in this country that we are trying to get to become gun owners, gun advocates, freedom advocates, when you are missing their perspective, you are asking them to conform to yours, which is different than freedom in its true sense. So we need to have an understanding of how other people may be looking at this. So that's why I wanted to bring it up to you. Now let's start talking about some particular incidents in history, um, just to have a, a little bit of an understanding of how people may be viewing this and where they may be coming from. So. I'm going to fast forward. Let's go to uh, the year 1923 in Rosewood, Florida. Okay. Rosewood, Florida, the Rosewood massacre is something that a lot of people don't know about. Uh, they are unaware of the incident occurring. They, they, they've never heard of it. Even people that live in Florida are like, what are you talking about? Uh, so let me, let me, let me share with you. In 1923, uh, there was a town, uh, Sumner, Florida, all right? Sumner, Florida uh, sat next to Rosewood, Florida. Sumner, Florida, predominantly white. Rosewood, predominantly black. They lived in relative peace, um, and everyone just kind of did their thing. However, there was a woman uh, that was in Sumner, a white woman, that was having an affair on her husband with a co-worker. Uh, her and the co-worker got into some kind of scuffle. It left her with bruises, and she couldn't explain to her husband that she was intimate with uh, someone else in town. So she stated that a black man 
came into her home and sexually assaulted her. Well, that led the husband, the local sheriff, and some community members to get a posse together to go look for this black man. There was a black man that escaped off a chain gang that was a military veteran, so they thought that they were hunting for him. Well, when they go to Rosewood to you know, make the people turn over this perpetrator, uh, the people could be of no assistance because they knew of no such assault, and the individual they were looking for was not like a permanent resident of the town. So they really couldn't be of assistance. Well, the posse turned into a mob and they started to murder and kill everyone in the town. Now, the sheriff did, to his credit, attempt to stop it. Once he saw that the posse turned into a mob, a murderous mob, he did attempt to stop it. Uh, even so much, he started to help black people es escape the community. Now, that's going to be very, very important because it goes to show you that law enforcement is not going to be able to assist you. You need to be able to protect yourself. Now, you might ask, well, Hey, it's Florida, right? Like, it's the gunshine state. I'm really interested in why these black people weren't, you know, fighting back with, with arms. Okay, we'll get to that. Well, the, the husband made a phone call to nearby Gainesville, which is 45 minutes away in Florida, where there happened to be a, a gathering of the uh, Ku Klux Klan, the KKK, were gathering in Gainesville. Roughly around 500 members were meeting for whatever purpose. Well, he made a phone call to him and said, hey, this is what we had happen, and I want some support. And so the KKK uh, went to Rosewood and assisted in the murder, torture, hangings, uh, dragging individuals behind uh, vehicles, burning them, clubbing them to death, mutilating their bodies, they assisted with that, and they eradicated Rosewood. Uh, it's a very somber experience. I myself have went to Rosewood, um, and it is a very somber experience. So after they killed, despite what the reports tell you, after they killed uh, well over a couple of hundred people, it, they just left. That was it. And you might ask, well, well what happened, though? Well, it was a lie. What came out of it was uh, the, the lady admitted that, yeah, nobody ever assaulted me besides my lover. Uh, there was no black man that ever broke into our home. There was no black man that ever assaulted me. Um, and she did confess to this before she died. Well, you can't take that back, right? It still led to a lot of vengeance and terror embarked upon a community. Now, that's very important to understand because in uh, 18, the late 1800s, there was a law because of the black labor force that was embarking upon the state of Florida. There was a law that was passed that stated, um, you know, black laborers couldn't own firearms, right? And it was enforced. Well, guess what? That community had inadequate arms. Were there a couple of guns here and there? Sure. But could people lawfully outright be armed? Not necessarily so. That law wasn't rescinded until 1941 when a judge in Florida admitted that that law did impact the ability of African Americans to defend themselves. So that law was rescinded in 1941. Well, guess what? That was too late. By that time, you allowed an entire community of people to be slaughtered. Now, that's one reason why we need to understand that is less than 100 years ago. That's less than 100 years ago. I want you to keep that in mind. Um, and then we have uh, incident that is being talked about more and more. We have Rosewood, Florida, 1921. And my time is running out, so I'll keep this one brief. Rosewood, Florida, 1921, once again, started off of a lie, uh, and people let their emotions take over, and they eradicated Greenwood, or uh, Little Africa, as some people would call it. They eradicated that community that was successful, that was thriving, that had its own, its own economy and everything self-sustained. They eradicated it, once again, based off of a lie, where you actually had law enforcement <clears throat> insisting in the murder of the black people, actually deputizing people by, by saying, and I quote, grab a gun, get an N-word. That's how they were deputizing people and putting little ribbons on them. So they went around murdering those people once again. Now in Tulsa, at the time, thanks to some Jim Crow laws, you could possibly have a long gun, but they didn't really trust you to have a concealable handgun. So at the time, guess what? Concealable handguns were frowned upon, so it was uh, it was interesting for regular self-defense to be out and about. Long story short, um, they fought over a handgun when a, a group of black gentlemen stood guard at the county jail to make sure that a falsely accused young black man was given a fair trial. Uh, a white man approached him, 
asked him, hey, N-word, what are you doing with that gun? And a struggle ensued. The next thing you know, at the end of it, there were upwards of 300 to 350 black individuals slaughtered in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, and once again, gun laws uh, prevented that. So I like to tell people, when someone tells you you can own this type of gun or that type of gun, that's the illusion of freedom. Nobody's going to give you something they know you can defend yourself against them with, right? So they want to arm you uh, with the illusion of freedom so you can believe that what you have is adequate enough to resist. So there's a couple of books that I want to leave with you guys, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you go and enjoy the rest of your, uh, your GRPC. The Burning. This is a very good book that I would like for everybody to check out by Tim Madigan. Uh, give that a read. That is talking about um, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 1921. Um, I also want you to read 1919, The Year of Racial Violence. I want you to read this book and, and you check this book out. This is a very, very good book. Um, it is a book I think a lot of individuals should read and understand. It covers, it covers a lot. Um, and then I want you guys to check out Negroes and the Gun. Okay, check out Negroes and the Gun. Those are some books I recommend to you. There's a falsehood to believing that uh, black Americans are vehemently anti-gun because we challenge a large portion of black Americans who happen to vote for a party that is known for supporting a gun control. What I want to inform you to at the essence of who we are, we are anything but anti-gun. We are um, an ethnic group, a culture of individuals that really have no choice but to believe in gun rights and preservation. So I just want to leave you with that. And I hope that this gave you some insight and a little perspective of how you can start embarking in conversations with somebody different than you that can actually help you relate to them and expand the conversation about gun rights. Thank you so much for listening to me. My name is Kevin Dixie. Once again, thank you for uh, being a part of the GRPC 2021. And I'll see you guys soon. Stay free and liberty. Hi, I'm Dave Kopel, Research Director of the Independence Institute in Denver, Colorado. Today I'd like to talk about U.S. Supreme Court history on the right to bear arms and to focus on the most important case the Supreme Court decided in the 19th century and still one of the most famous cases today. That is the 1856 case of Dred Scott v. Sanford. Now if you'd like some background on the case, my uh, lawyer and uh, scholarly friend David Hardy has written an excellent book on the topic that goes into all the background and he details how Dred Scott was actually a test case uh, brought by anti-slavery folks. Well, it was a test that went pretty badly because the result in the Supreme Court was disastrous for the rights of, of black people in general and uh, including fr free black people. But the case does show a lot about how the court and the public understood the right to keep and bear arms at the time and thereafter. Dred Scott was suing Sanford in what, what is called diversity jurisdiction. That's provided in the United States Constitution for federal courts, and it involves a suit between a citizen of one state versus a citizen of another state. Now, the question is, uh, you have to have diversity of jurisdiction. You can't have two people from one, two citizens from the same state suing each other nor can diversity jurisdiction be invoked by someone who is not a citizen of the United States. Now, if the Dred Scott Court had had the advantage of Lexis and Westlaw like we do today, they could have looked at cases from the 1790s where federal courts absolutely said that free blacks were citizens of the United States in the sense that they could bring diversity lawsuits in federal courts. But without the research and perhaps with, with a lot of bias, the majority of the Supreme Court ruled that even free blacks in the United States, born and raised here, were not citizens of the United States. They might be citizens of the state where they lived, but that was, that was up to the state, but they weren't United States citizens. And in making that argument, Chief Justice Taney, who wrote the Dred Scott opinion, gave his list of the unacceptable policy consequences that would happen if free blacks were recognized as citizens. If they were, then they would have, under Article 4 of the U.S. Constitution, 
the privileges and immunities of citizens of the United States. What are these privileges and immunities of citizens of the United States? Well, he said if they were blacks were, or free blacks were, were citizens, they'd have the right to enter any state, to stay there as long as they pleased, and within that state they could go where they wanted at any hour of day or night unless they committed some act for which a white person could be punished. Further, black citizens would have, quote, the right to full liberty of speech in public and private upon all subjects which a state's own citizens might meet, to hold public meetings upon political affairs, and to keep and carry arms wherever they went. The right to keep and carry arms wherever you go is one of the privileges and immunities of citizens of the United States. Now, Dred Scott created a lot of controversy with its holding that free blacks were not citizens, but it created even more controversy with its second holding, that the 1820 Missouri Compromise was unconstitutional. The Missouri Compromise had banned slavery in federal territories north of the 38th parallel, such as the uh, future state of Nebraska. Now, Chief Justice Taney said that was unconstitutional because it was a violation of the property rights, so-called, uh, of the slaveholders who wanted to bring their, their slaves into, the, uh, into a territory. To make that argument, Justice Taney started with something that was universally agreed by everyone, which is the federal government, when it's legislating for federal territories, can't violate the, the rights of United States citizens in the territories. Here's what he said. No one, we presume, will contend that Congress can make any law in a territory respecting the establishment of religion or the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people uh, of, of the territory peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. Nor can Congress deny to the people the right to keep and bear arms, nor the right to trial by jury, nor compel anyone to be a witness against himself in a criminal proceeding. So right there, he goes through a litany of the rights in the Bill of Rights, says Congress can't violate them for the people in the territories, and he includes in the rights the right to keep and bear arms. Now, this kind of shows the silliness of the theory that became popular in some quarters in the last part of the 20th century, that the Second Amendment isn't a right of individual citizens, it's only a right of state governments, it's only a right of the militias. The view here is just the opposite. It's the right of all citizens in the territories, just like the, the rest of the Bill of Rights is. Now, the Dred Scott case caused a uh, sensation and a furor in the United States, and it led, uh, in significant part, was a major cause of the Civil War. And the Civil War led to the abolition of slavery. But what was going to happen after the Civil War? Well, on May 10, 1865, the great Frederick Douglass gave a major speech in New York City addressing exactly that issue. It was titled, In What New Skin Will the Old Snake Come Forth? And what I'm about to read was uh, quoted by uh, Justice Clarence Thomas in his concurring opinion in the case of McDonald versus Chicago. Douglas predicted that even though formal slavery was certainly going to be abolished, the former slave states would try to find ways to keep the black population in a state, in a state of de facto servitude, and part of that would be pre preventing them from keeping and bearing arms. He talked about what needed to be changed and why there was a constitutional amendment. That Not only did we need a constitutional amendment against slavery, we needed another constitutional amendment to protect the civil rights of all people, including free people of color. Because without that, said Douglas, the legislatures of the South can take from him, the former slave, the right to keep and bear arms as they can. They would not allow a Negro to walk with a cane where I came from, that was Maryland. They would not allow five of them to assemble together at night. Douglas continued, Notwithstanding the provision in the Constitution of the United States that the right to keep and bear arms shall not be abridged, the black man has never had the right either to keep or bear arms. And he said until there is a new constitutional amendment to make the states obey the Second Amendment, the work of the abolitionists is not finished. Well, the abolitionists made a lot of progress by passing the 14th Amendment in Congress in 1866 and then getting it ratified in 18, by the states in 1868. But that work still took a long time because it was not until 2010, in the case of McDonald versus, McDonald versus City of Chicago, brought by uh, the Second Amendment Foundation, 
where the U.S. Supreme Court finally said that states do have to obey the Second Amendment. Now, that case involved some, uh, Otis McDonald, Rhonda Azell, and other good citizens of Chicago who wanted to have handguns in their home for lawful protection. And even today, uh, states such as New York, New Jersey, or Maryland, Douglas's old state, will at least grudgingly allow people to have handguns in their home for lawful protection, but they still won't allow people to carry handguns for lawful self-defense. In other words, people like uh, the plaintiffs in New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin, currently before the Supreme Court, are fighting over the same kind of issue that was going on in Dred Scott. They say, look, we're citizens of the United States. The Second Amendment protects us. The Second Amendment protects the right to bear arms. And the 14th Amendment means that state and local governments have to obey the Second Amendment. And you still won't let us even get a permit to carry a firearm. Back in uh, the Dred Scott days, Chief Justice Taney didn't think that people needed permits. He said you can keep and carry arms wherever you go uh, if you're a citizen of the United States. And the plaintiffs in the Bruin case aren't even asking for that. They're just asking to be able to go through a permitting process to be able to exercise their right to bear arms. So these issues that were at, uh, contested in Dred Scott in 1856 are still at issue today in 2021. Because as it turns out, civil rights are not something you win once and for all, and then you're set. There's a continuing struggle to fight for civil liberties. If you'd like to learn more about these issues, well, please come to my website, davecopel.org, where I've got all sorts of historical, legal, and, and other scholarship uh, for you to read, much of it for free. Please buy my books. I could use the money. And some of the books are listed behind me, including the brand new third edition of my law school textbook, Firearms Law and the Second Amendment, which has been quoted by then-Judge Kavanaugh when he was on the D.C. Circuit and, and uh, Judge Hardiman of the Third Circuit. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, at Dave Kopel. I put out a uh, uh, twice-a-day uh, newspaper, Kopel's Law and Liberty News, which aggregates content from all, the country, all over the United States. And I do more videos on Independence Institute television. So please come back, and thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm George Moxery. I'm a professor of law at the University of Wyoming College of Law and adjunct scholar at the Firearms Policy Coalition. Uh, I'll be speaking to you today about the antecedents of the Second Amendment. By that, I mean pre-English antecedents. Um, others will be speaking about the English material, and it shows up regularly in briefs and scholarship. I'll focus today on ancient Greece and Rome, and primarily on Aristotle and Cicero. That's because the, the framers studied classical history to understand how liberty had been defended, advanced, and then lost. Thomas Jefferson described Aristotle and Cicero as being among the major sources of the American consensus on rights and liberty. Um, if this material interests you, you might enjoy the free online chapter of my co-authors in my casebook, Firearms Law and the Second Amendment. Uh, the chapter is named Antecedents of the Second Amendment, and it's available at firearmsregulation.org at the online chapters tab. In addition to more material on Greece and Rome, <clears throat> excuse me, it discusses the early Far East, Judeo-Christian thought, uh, and Italian and French influences from second millennium Europe. So let's start with Greece. The substance of the Greek law on the matter was stated by uh, Demosthenes, uh, a famous or orator, uh, lawyer, and he was a speechwriter for parties and legal disputes. Uh, in 352 BC, the Athenian Senate passed a decree eliminating due process, uh, abolishing self-defense, and giving absolute immunity to one Charidemus, a mercenary who at various times fought for or against Athens. Demosthenes, as part of a lawsuit against Aristocrates, the decree's drafter, first stated the historical law and analyzed it. So, quote, the law. If one resisting unlawful seizure or violence shall immediately kill the aggressor, his death shall not be punishable. If a man resisting any lawful seizure or violence shall immediately kill the aggressor, he orders that the death shall not be punishable. Pray observe how wisely. 
but his first, but his having first mentioned the causes for which life may be taken, and then adding the word immediately, he left no time for contriving any foul play. By the word resisting, it is clear that he gives the power to the aggrieved party, not to anyone else. The law has therefore given permission to kill immediately in self-defense. He then railed against uh, what, end quote, he then railed against what he saw as the, co the consequences would be if the ab abolition of self-defense was combined with giving a mercenary immunity. So again, quote, who will a Charidemus attacker seize unjustly? Everybody. For you are, of course, aware that all military commanders lay violent hands upon whom they think they can overpower. It is not shameful, then. It is not manifestly illegal, contrary to not only the written law, but to the common law of all mankind, that I am not at liberty to resist a person who seizes or forcibly carries off my property, treating me as an enemy, end quote. So that's the law. Now, Aristotle's teacher, Plato, reaffirmed this view when he described how a democratic people fall under the sway of a demagogic tyrant. Under Plato's theory, <clears throat> a democracy eventually succumbs to demagogy and a would-be tyrant comes to power. Then the tyrant, while still possessing the population's trust, disarms it and then uses violence to keep it oppressed. Plato's ideal of self-defense also matched the law that we stated earlier. Quote, if a brother kills brother in a civil broil or under like circumstances, if the other has begun and he only defends himself, let him be free from guilt as he would be if he had slain an enemy. And the same rule will apply if a citizen kills a citizen or a stranger a stranger. Or if a stranger kill a citizen or a citizen a stranger in self-defense, let him be free from guilt in like manner, and so in the case of a slave who has killed a slave. If a man catch a thief coming into his house by night to steal, and he take and kill him, or if he slay a footpad in self-defense, he shall be guiltless." End quote. But, and this is important, Plato uh, placed a limitation on self-defense. It was forbidden against uh, social superiors. So he said, quote, but if, if a slave have killed a freeman in self-defense, let him be subject to the same law as who, he who has killed a father, end quote. And so this is where Aristotle differs. Aristotle criticized the theory of the philosopher Hippodamus, who wanted a strict division of roles between skilled labor, agriculture, and defense. He found the division defective because it would lead to the, the armed ruling the unarmed. Again, quote, but the husbandmen have no arms, and the artisans neither arms nor land, and therefore they become all but slaves of the warrior class." End quote. He, strong, he saw a strong connection between arms and self-government. He said that, quote, in a constitutional government, the fighting men have the supreme power, and those who possess arms are the citizens. End quote. And he famously added that, quote, as of oligarchy, so of tyranny both mistrust the people and therefore deprive them of their arms. Now, the American view was decidedly and is decidedly Aristotelian, and it was even demonstrated by the 1859 case of State versus Davis, in which the North Carolina Supreme Court ruled that a freedman had the right to use violence against the white law enforcement officer in the case of unlawful arrest, and quoting the opinion again. The conviction of the defendant may involve the proposition that a free Negro is not justified under any circumstances in striking a white man. To this, we cannot yield our assent. An officer of the town having a notice to serve the defendant without any authority whatever, arrests him and attempts to tie him in italics and two exclamation points. Is this not gross oppression? What degree of cruelty might not the defendant reasonably apprehend after he should be entirely in the power of one who had set upon him in so high-handed and lawless a manner? Was he to submit tamely? Or was he not excusable for resorting to the natural right of self-defense? Upon the facts stated, we think his honor ought to have instructed the jury to find the defendant not guilty. 
So that's Greece and its influence on, on modern times. Rome uh, was similar. The 12, the 12 tablets stated Roman law quite clearly. Item 12 from the tablet said the following. If a theft be committed at night and the thief be killed, let his death be lawful. If in the daytime, only if he, meaning the thief, defend himself with weapons, end quote. And so this fits with what Cicero, uh, the Roman orator said when he was serving as a defense attorney for an accused murderer. Um, he prepared an argument in his client's defense, which stated the following. This therefore is a law, nature her herself ingrained in us, namely that if our life be in danger from plots or from open violence, or from the weapons of robbers or enemies, every means of securing our safety is honorable. For laws are silent when arms are raised and do not expect themselves to be waited for. The man who had used a weapon with the object of defending himself would be decided not to have had his weapon about him with the object of killing a man." End quote. Ironically, and tellingly, I would say, Troops loyal to his client's enemy, the deceased in the case, intimidated Cicero into silence by surrounding the courtroom in which he intended to give his speech. And finally, Cicero was also an advocate of tyrannicide. One last quote from him. He, uh, has he then involved himself in guilt who slays a tyrant? He does not appear so to the Roman people at least, who of all great exploits deems that the most honorable." End quote. With that, I'll thank you for listening to this small sampling of material that influenced our founders um, and ultimately the world we live in now. Please do enjoy the rest of the conference. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. I am John Richardson of the blog, No Lawyers, Only Guns and Money. I've spoken at a number of the past gun rights policy conferences. However, it has always been on the panel on the use of new media to advance our gun rights. This year, I was asked to be on the history panel. I've been a collector of old firearms for a number of years. I've had my Curios and Relics Federal Firearms License for going on 25 years now. Two sets of firearms will provide the basis for my presentation today, entitled Arm Neutrality. They are Swedish Mausers and Schmidt Rubin Rifles. Let's look at this map of where things stood in Europe in 1941-42. The red represents the Allies, the blue the Axis powers, the little bit of white neutral countries. You have countries on the periphery of Europe such as Ireland, Spain, Portugal, and Turkey. Then you have the two that I will talk about today, Sweden and Switzerland. Switzerland was bordered on one side by Nazi-occupied Norway and the other by Finland which was now fighting what was called the Continuation War alongside the Germans to regain territory it had lost to the Soviets during the Winter War. For the Finns, it was the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Switzerland was surrounded on all sides by countries occupied by the Nazis or their allies. The Germans did have a plan called Operation Tannenbaum for the invasion of Switzerland. It was probably only abandoned due to Swiss topography and their known fierceness in protecting their own neutrality. There is an apocryphal story about Kaiser Wilhelm on a state visit to Switzerland. He remarked to a grizzled old Swiss sergeant major that his standing army was twice the size of the Swiss army, even including their reserves. Kaiser Wilhelm then asked the sergeant major what would happen if Germany should invade Switzerland. The old sergeant major thought on it and replied, well, the Swiss would then have to fire their rifles twice. Here you have the 6.5 millimeter cartridge. It was a joint development between the Norwegians and the Swedes. In the picture, if you look at the, the top is inert, followed by a spitzer, wooden, the original round nosed, and then a gallery. I have with me today three rifles that epitomize what the Swedes would have had during World War II. The first two are Mausers. In fact, one was actually made by the Germans. If you can see. 
This is called the M96. Typical Mauser has the flip up flag safety. Longer rifle, it was meant for infantry, has a straight, as you can see there, a straight uh, bolt. Uh, and typical Mauser. Uh, so, and this was called the Model 96. It replaced the Model 94, which was a much smaller rifle, also made uh, by a combination of either Mauser Obendorf or Carl Gustav. This model, this example here, was actually made in Germany by Obendorf Mauser. Most, however, are made by Carl Gustav Stad. One, you will notice it has a bent, um, a bent bolt handle. Uh, the wood, I think, is probably beech. It has the typical Mauser flag, same bolt, etc., except it's shorter. It was originally meant for cavalry. Um, and one thing you will also notice that every Swedish Mauser has this little disc on it. And it's what the armories could tell you how, what the throat magazine was, what kind of shape it was in. And this, this in the Mauser 96, the Mauser, there was also an interim called the 9638, which were just as basically made by Carl Gustav. The 38 actually was made by Husqvarna, the same people that make motorcycles and the same people that make uh, very nice chainsaws. It's called a Youngman. Magazine fed, though probably mostly used uh, through stripper clips. Very accurate. Semi-automatic. There were about 30,000 of these made starting in 1942. The Youngman, or spelled L-J-U-N-G-M-A-N-N, was actually the basis for the Egyptian Hakim. This even has, if you can see it, very sh has a muzzle brake built into it. So not only does it have the lower recoil uh, ma uh, cartridge of the 6.5 Mauser, it even has a muzzle brake, so it's going to be even less recoil. And the beauty of the 6.5 was it was very accurate. It had an ex exceptionally good ballistic coefficient, and it had a lot of power. You think, oh, it's smaller than 30 odd six. It's smaller than a millimeter Mauser. Smaller than the seven millimeter Mauser. However, in Sweden, it is the typical rifle used for hunting what they call elk, what we in the U.S. would call moose. Moving on to the Swiss rifles, you have what's called the Schmidt Rubin. Originally, there was the 1896, which became the 1896 slash 11, the 1911, and then the K31. The distinctive feature of the Schmidt Rubens was number one, the round 7.5 Swiss or 7.5 by 55, always a non-corrosive round. But more importantly, if you look, you can see it has a very distinctive straight pull bolt. Um, this is the 1896 11. The difference is between the 96 and the 1911. It has a pistol grip, has ladder sights, Marked out to two uh, two thousand meters, they were very pleased with their marksmanship. Um, Thirty-one inch barrel with a blade front sight that is not hooded. Um, the there we go, cocked, and they all feature this very interesting cocking piece and safety 
As you see right now, it's turned, it's on safe. You do like that and it's ready to go. Um, this has a 31 inch barrel, uh, not necessarily the most convenient size. They all have a detachable magazine that they would feed through stripper clips. It is grooved for stripper, yeah, there we go. It is grooved for stripper clips. So this one has a 31 inch barrel. Um, to the more ubiquitous K31 Schmidt Rubin, it still has the straight pull. The, the bolt handle is a little different in that it doesn't have the Bakelite uh, uh, knobs on it. They went to aluminum, I think. Still has the same safety. Ladder sights. This time it's only marked to 1500 meters. The, as you can tell, the front blade side is protected by wings. And it's got about a 25 and a half inch barrel. So they've cut the size down. They've made it quote a carbine. Um, uh, might be walnut. I know the other one is walnut. This probably is walnut. Uh, I've seen some with beech as well. Uh, see if you can, I'm not sure if you can see it, but they all feature the little crest with the the Swiss cross, and they're incredibly accurate rifles. Like I said earlier, none they've never been fired with corrosive ammo, so you don't have to worry about the bores being worn out, other than shooting. And the Swiss do take their marksmanship very seriously. Every city, every town, every village has a shooting range. Uh, excellent ammo, match grade, GP, it's called GP11. You can, quite find, you can find it on the US market quite frequently. Like anything, Swiss engineered, it's precision. It's essentially a Swiss watch of rifles. Thank you for watching today. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, collecting rifles is collecting pieces of history. And that's the reason I got into it. How through these rifles, how the Swiss and the Swedes maintained their neutrality. Uh, or as a book I have calls it, Neutrality Through Marksmanship. They were well-armed, well-organized. And they said, we don't want part of your wars and we will defend our territory. And they made it stick. So I hope the rest of your gun rights policy conference is good. And thanks again to the Second 